75 years ago, the Bretton Woods Conference laid the foundations for much of today's global economic order. But the system is facing a serious threat from growing nationalism and protectionism worldwide. While today the US is in a trade war with China, the foundations of international trade were laid to avoid war altogether. In this video, we will give you a quick rundown of the Bretton Woods system, the system of global trade that emerged at the end of World War II. Welcome back to the Atlantis Report. You are here for your daily dose of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please take a second to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and don't forget to also hit the notification bell. Thank you. So here is a little history lesson, we are going to talk about the Bretton Woods system. So the year is 1944 the end of World War II was in sight the Allies realizing that they were going to win, wanted to get together and talk about creating a world where war and depression could never happen again, they met in Bretton Woods New Hampshire, there they spent a month negotiating, there were 730 people or delegates from 44 different countries all our allies, and essentially what they did was create a three-legged stool a tripod of institutions to guide the post-war world. This is how that three-legged stool works today. The first leg is the International Monetary Fund or IMF. The IMF works with countries that are having problems with money problems with debt and paying back the money that they borrowed, and the IMF gives them advice on how to change their internal policies and structures in order to fix the problems that they've got. The second leg is the World Bank back in 1944 when the delegates met at Bretton Woods they realized that poverty is a big motivating force when it comes to conflict and violence and they decided that if they could help countries grow and create jobs there would be a better chance of peace. So the World Bank is primarily a lending institution with a goal of ending extreme poverty and it lends money to poor countries for economic development. The third leg of the stool as it stands today is the World Trade Organization or WTO. The WTO promotes global trade and free trade, and it also functions as a courtroom for member countries to resolve trade disputes with one another. Basically, the WTO upholds the rules of international trade. So the money changers that financed both sides of World War II met in July of 1944 to figure out how they could keep their scam going. This year French finance minister Bruno Le Maire has publicly admitted something normally reserved for backroom discussion in the circles of Europe's governing elite at an event honoring the 75th anniversary of Bretton Woods. Le Maire stated ever so candidly that the Bretton Woods order had reached its limits. Unless we are able to reinvent Bretton Woods, the new Silk Road might become the new world order. Le Maire dives so deeply out of the reality that he actually believes that the radical transformation desperately needed in the West does not involve collaborating with the new Silk Road but rather strengthening the power of Brussels while becoming more technocratic and more green, aka de-industrialized, depopulated. The Bretton Woods of 1944 and New Silk Road of today 75 years of revisionist historians largely funded by the British Round Table, Chatham House and its American branch, the Council on Foreign Relations, have obstructed the true anti-imperial nature of the founding intention of Bretton Woods and the post-war order centered on the United Nations. Then, much as today, two opposing factions were vying to shape the essence of the world order as the Nazi machine, funded by Wall Street and London's Bank of International Settlements, was drawing to a close. I am not talking about capitalism versus communism. This faction fight was between New Deal nationalists led by Franklin Roosevelt versus those racist imperialists represented by Sir Winston Churchill who wished to use the crisis of the war to establish a revived British empire strengthened by American muscle. FDR's New Dealers were characterized by their total adherence to the belief that the plague of colonialism had to be undone, and a new age of long-term development of great infrastructure projects had to characterize the community of sovereign nations for the coming century. These patriots believed in the internationalization of the New Deal, were committed to working with Russia and China as natural allies of America, and profoundly distrusted the British. In the case of Bretton Woods, where representatives from 44 nations convened for two weeks to create a new post-war system in July 1944, this fight amounted to a battle between FDR's trusted economic advisor Harry Dexter White first director of the IMF and ally of FDR's Vice President Henry Wallace and Lord John Maynard Keynes defender of the British Empire. 
Bretton Woods was just an extension of the 1913 Federal Reserve Act much related to JFK assassination and Nixon's resignation prior to impeachment as the 1971 shock was supposed to be temporary as a result of the Yom Kippur War to the staged OPEC boycott. Bretton Woods reached its limits in the 1960s and was abandoned to all intents and purposes in 1971, and the US dollar came off the gold standard in 1971. Coincidence? I think not. When King Abdulaziz bin Abdul Rahman, founder of Saudi Arabia, was asked by an American reporter why raise the oil price so high by OPEC, he answered, why don't you ask your president? Senior G.W. Bush was pretty much involved in the scam. Bretton Woods was dead with the Nixon shock of 1971. Today it's the petrodollar system that is dying. Bretton Woods failed right from the start. Bretton Woods was the woodstock of high-profile banksters getting together to screw a country on their behalf. Putting a plan into place that would culminate in a nation, not of diversity, but of wealth inequality. Debasing the currency and the system for their own enrichment. Eliminating the gold standard to accelerate their plans for control of the financial system and wealth. We have to admit, from their, the rich 0.01%, that put this plan together have to be admired for their zealousness and quiet scheming to achieve their goals. Many of us see the introduction of a single, world currency, as a major part of the economic endgame. This is something that will be forced on us as part of a, needed reset, to a global economy that has gone off track. The fact this issue is again in the news may be an indication we are getting closer to where currencies begin to fail. The new world order and globalization which has been pushed by many world leaders and the rich elite touting that larger, more cooperative governments under one financial unit will benefit us all, plays into the world currency scenario. In contrast of Bretton Woods, the Belt and Road is a productive, win-win economics that helps everyone. The Anglo Investment Bank, rent-seeking crap we've been living with is evil. That's why you see Huawei Princess being kidnapped in Canada and smearing campaign by all five eyes against Huawei a private company with fabricated facts. That's why you see constantly launching media smearing campaigns against China and to the extent of funding color revolution in Hong Kong, the separatist movement in Taiwan Falun Gong and Tsai Ing-wen, the Chinese version Ala Wan Guaido of Venezuela, Tibet, expired CIA monk Dalai Lama and terrorism in Xinjiang pretending to care about their operatives the Uyghur Muslims. Just waste of resources in hoping of uprisings that lead to regime change will fail like in Venezuela, Syria, Iran. The Silk Road Summit, officially called the Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation, took place on May 14 and 15, 2017 in Beijing. Officially announced at Davos by Xi Jinping, Chinese government bodies and state media have since then carefully let out information surrounding the summit. Two dozen world leaders attended the summit, coming from Asia, Europe, Africa, and Latin America. Along with them, ministerial delegations, representatives from international organizations, former dignitaries, well-known industry figures, and influential experts were also present. Echoing in opposite the declarations of the Trump administration, the theme of the summit revolved around a core tenet of globalization, trade connectivity. Very much like the Bretton Woods Conference, the initial impulse of the Belt and Road and its summit stems from an eagerness to address the economic woes of our age and challenges to globalization. In 1944 there was a collective consensus that the catastrophic mid-war period stemmed from the denial of the US to provide public goods while it had already surpassed Great Britain as the leading industrial economy. A case well understood by Charles Kindleberger, the intellectual architect of the Marshall Plan. Today, the Belt and Road's larger effect is to solidify a greater world community around a dominant core, China, and a wider periphery, Eurasia. It is the latter that has the potential to bring about new relations of power within the world economy. This is not to say we are seeing the birth of a new global system per se, but rather a shift in the current one, a shift of its center of gravity from the Atlantic Ocean to Eurasia. Henry Kissinger has captured this in his latest book, World Order, declaring that Eurasian economic integration turns the US into a peripheral geopolitical island. Though the general rules of the game remain valid, some big players lose their advantage and others rise to the occasion, while the disruption allows many more to enter the game. In the same way, post Bretton Woods England lost its primacy, while Germany, a renewed European community, Japan and many parts of Asia rose simultaneously. 
Therefore, despite obvious differences between the Bretton Woods power dynamics and today's uncertain present, there remains a major similarity. The nascence of both an abstract community and an institutional structure capable of upholding a global political economic system, previously guaranteed by the United States and today placed slowly under the guardianship of the Middle Kingdom. In fact, this renewed system's major institutions and policies have already been decided. From the AIIB which is seen by the United States at least as a competitor to the World Bank, to the countless bilateral and multilateral agreements that have tied the economic fate of countries around the globe to China, a great part of Eurasia is now infused by the structures and stories needed to create a new Sino-centric status quo. In a multipolar world, the formation of global governance architecture is not episodic, but an ongoing systematic process, and Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative Summit was not designed to plot for a compelling Chinese victory, but instead orchestrate China's return as a vigorous global power. With its idea of win-win cooperation, China always wins. If political leverage is merely a useful side effect, what does China have to gain from the billions of dollars it spends on infrastructure abroad? China's model of development is based on trade. Better infrastructure is meant to increase trade, which spurs development. The Belt and Road Initiative aims to connect and develop China's western regions, but it also aims to develop other markets to its own advantage. The West has reached its growth potential and is not going to buy more from China. But Africa, with its large, young and growing population, is the continent with the real growth potential. By spurring development in African countries, China wants to develop and open up a new market on the continent. Moreover, infrastructure development projects are an investment in a better relationship between the Chinese government and the government of the recipient country. By handing out the loan, there is a diplomatic gain already, because it tightens the ties with that particular country. That is a gain for China that cannot be expressed in money. This was the Atlantis Report. Please like. Share. Leave me a comment. Subscribe. And please take some time to subscribe to my backup channels, I do upload videos there too. You'll find the links in the description box. You will also find a PayPal link if you want to make a donation. Thank you wholeheartedly to all those of you who have already donated. Stay safe and healthy friends.